thanks so much. I'm really, really happy to be here, especially because it's uh, Women's History Month and it's the perfect time to, to share uh, some of my postcards and other treasures from the women's suffrage movement. Um, and thanks to Eileen and Gina, Sarah and Adam um, for their assistance um, in putting this together because Adam and Sarah worked with me to digitize my postcards last week and that's why you're able to see them on the screen and I, I definitely could not have done that by myself. Uh, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's a really beautiful uh, afternoon so I especially appreciate your being here. So I want to start out with just some background about the American women's fight to gain the right to vote. Um, it's such an important chapter in our history, yet like so much of women's history, um, there, there's very little time devoted to teaching about it, both in K through 12 and beyond. Um, so, and, and it's a great, great, important story of a struggle for, for just simple, basic justice. Um, so I love talking about it, and I actually teach, among other classes that I teach at Stockton, I teach an entire course called Women in the Law, that Eileen knows that class. Um, she, one semester, um, actually took the class, <laughs> which is really fun. Um, and and I, I want to just uh, applaud Eileen and the staff here at Hamilton for this wonderful lecture series, uh, March Towards Equity. Um, you know, I really appreciate your acknowledgement, Sister, because it's just such an important thing to do. Um, okay, so uh, just make sure I can get this working. Um, let me begin just with some background. Um, so early in in our history, women's rights advocates recognized the importance of constitutional recognition for women's equality. Obviously, the Constitution is our fundamental political charter. It structures our government, and it identifies specific rights and liberties that we, as individual citizens, have. Um, and these are rights that are so fundamental that they cannot be taken away by any of the states. Um, so obviously, um, constitutional guarantees for the right to vote, among other essential liberties, are really important. A very early voice for women's constitutional equality was Abigail Adams. Um, she, was, she was the wife of one of the key founding fathers, John Adams, um, and had, as he worked on the Declaration of Independence, she wrote to him in March uh, of 1776, and among other things, she said, remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable, for, favorable to them than your ancestors. Um, a month later, uh, this was obviously prior to email, um, he <laughs> finally sarcastically replied, as to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. Depend upon it, depend upon it, we know better than to repeal our masculine systems. Um, and her response uh, was in May of 1776 was prophetic. She said, but you must remember that arbitrary power is like most other things that are very hard, very liable to be broken. Um, essentially, Abigail Adams predicted that women would ultimately rebel and revolt. <clears throat> of course, within two months of Abigail's last letter, the Declaration of Independence was signed, and the ladies were not remembered. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, as you know, declares that all men are created equal, but contains no explicit reference to uh, women and the rights of women. The Constitution was adopted in 1787. The Bill of Rights was added in 1793. Uh, neither contained explicit mention of equality for women, and nor did they mention even basic guarantees of citizenship for women. Um, the issue of determining who would be allowed to vote was left to the states. They, in turn, uh, tied voting t rights, as you know, to race, so that meant being white, um, to sex, being male, and in some instance, be also being a property owner. 
Um, and uh, at that time, uh, the, the vast majority of states, owning property was a status reserved to, to white males. Um, New, New Jersey, by the way, was an exception in, in its original constitution. Uh, women actually were uh, uh, property-owning women, that is, that would be unmarried women, uh, because married women were not allowed to own property, um, were allowed to vote in New Jersey uh, for about 30 years, um, and that right was then taken away by the legislature in 1807 um, and not restored again until many years later. Um, so turning this situation around um, was a very difficult challenge. Um, our federal constitution is really tough to amend. Um, as you probably know, it requires a supermajority in the Congress, that's two-thirds of the Congress, um, and then the states must, must ratify, and that's uh, three-fourths of the states, so that now would mean 38 of the 50 states have to ratify. Um, there have been lots of attempts to amend our federal constitution, um, something like 11 to 12,000 amendments have been introduced in the Congress over the years. But in over 200 years, as you know, there have only been 27 amendments to our Constitution. Um, Ten of those were in, in 1793 when the Bill of Rights were added, and then three were during the civil year, uh, year a post-Civil War uh, period with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So when you think about that history, that's very few amendments. So some constitutions in other countries, and even in our states, have many, many amendments. We have relatively few, um, and that's because of the difficulty of the process. So the formal kickoff of the women's rights movement and the effort to bring about reforms that would improve the status of women came in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York. Um, in Seneca Falls, um, women and men came together, nearly 300 of them, and they were led by a Philadelphian, Luc Lucretia Mott, um, and her friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And at Seneca Falls, they wrote and they endorsed a famous document called the Declaration of Sentiments. And this, was, this is, um, indicates who, the, who signed the Declaration of Sentiments. And you will see some names that you'll recognize uh, among the ladies, uh, Lucretia Maud and, and Harriet K Cady uh, Eaton, who is uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's sister. And then you see Elizabeth Cady Stanton on there, the fourth on the list. And then among the gentlemen, you'll see, for example, uh, Frederick Douglass. So some very famous men of the time came to Seneca Falls. So, this amazing document basically paraphrased the Declaration of Independence, but rewrote it to insist that, and here's the quotation from it, women have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. Um, it declared that women would use every instrumentality within their power to achieve women's equality. So this was quite revolutionary to do this. Um, and then it contained an exhaustive list of all of the areas where women were denied equality. And at the top of the list was the lack of the ability to vote. Um, but it also listed all the other restrictions that existed at the time. The restriction on married women, for example, owning property. Restrictions on equal access to employment outside the home. Restrictions on equal access to education. I mean, it's an amazing document, and if you want to have a clear snapshot of the legal status of women in the United States in 1848, read the Declaration of Sentiments. You can find it online, and you know it's it's really interesting to read it. I also um, want to plug uh, Daria is here also who was also one of my students in Women in the Law, um, taking a trip to Seneca Falls. Has anybody been there? Yeah, it's a wonderful place. It's located in New York State um, between Rochester and Syracuse. And it is um, uh, the, the site of the Women's Rights Historical Park uh, run by the National Park Service, uh, which is a really wonderful collection of women's rights memorabilia. 
and the, the remains of the Wesleyan Chapel where the Declaration of Sentiments was uh, written and the convention occurred um, are, they, are still there. You can tour that. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's home is there. Um, that whole area of New York, Rochester, uh, Seneca Falls, Syracuse, is really rich with the history of both abolitionists and, and uh, women um, in, and men in the suffrage movement. Um, in Rochester is Susan B. Anthony's home. Uh, in Auburn, New York is Harriet Tubman's home. So there's just a lot of history there. I, I highly, highly recommend it. And, and very good wine because it's the Finger Lakes. <laughs> so the, the Seneca Falls Convention kicked off a campaign that had winning the vote for women as its central goal. It took 72 years. The ultimate goal was finally achieved, as you know, in 1920, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, which prohibited the denial uh, of, the, of voting on the basis of sex. Uh, the campaign itself was amazing. Think of what it took to carry this off in the mid to late 1800s, when, when mainly the people who were doing this advocacy in a democracy could not themselves vote. Um, and they had to go into all of the states and do this advocacy, and then they had to go to the Congress and do this advocacy. Um, they rode horses, they trains, carriages, they walked. They faced miles of, of hard travel in frontier America. And, and in the years before telephones, automobiles, and electricity, they endured incredibly hostile audiences who, um, you know, who ridiculed them and condescend, you know, yelled condescending comments to them. Um, and they employed every political tactic imaginable letter writing, lobbying, civil disobedience. Susan B. Anthony and others went to vote, voting booths and just voted and then got arrested and hauled off. Um, they picketed at the White House, uh, which led to their arrest. Um, and some of you may know this was depicted very well um, in a film called Iron Draw Angels. Um, Alice Paul and others, um, when they were in prison for picketing in the White House, uh, undertook hunger strikes, um, and they were force-fed, violently force-fed in prison. Um, they also brought litigation. Uh, one of the cases uh, went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, uh, Minor versus Happersett. Um, they argued that uh, women should have the right to vote uh, under the existing Constitution, and they invoked the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment, and the Supreme Court basically laughed at them. So I can't think of much else that you could do um, in our democracy. Uh, uh, although one other thing that they did do, uh, which is actually one of my favorite things, is they had glorious parades in all major cities. Um, and this beautiful image, is why we wanted to turn off the lights and lower the shades so you can get a sense of the colors. This is the official program uh, brochure for the March 3rd, 1913 parade in Washington, D.C. It was a parade that was timed uh, to take place on the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. And the idea was that lots of people would be coming to D.C. anyway, and this was kind of a way of being in their face and kind of upstaging them. Uh, it featured 26 floats, 10 bands, six golden chariots, and divisions of six to 10,000 women marching right, from all over the United States and, and, and from other countries. Um, and it was led by a woman named Inez Milholland who rode a white horse. Um, it's a very beautiful young woman who was 27 at the time. Um, she was one of the leaders of the suffrage movement, worked very closely with Alice Paul. Um, sadly, she worked so hard, um, she was, her health was not good, but she continued to go all around the country advocating for suffrage. Three years later, after leading the parade, she died at the age of 30. 
um, from pernicious anemia. So 19, six, this, is, this happened in 1916. This year is the 100th anniversary of the death of Inez Milholland. Um, so you may see some interesting things around that, around her, her death, her centennial of her death. Um, there's a, a new documentary coming out that tells the story of Inez Milholland. A couple of books have, been, have recently come out. Um, there is an effort uh, you know, to get her some official recognition, you know, more official recognition. Some, some major awards, that kind of thing. Um, but she's an important figure, and I always like to acknowledge her. Um, and let's see. Am I doing this right? Yes, OK. So this is just another, uh, another photo from a parade. And this is um, a woman named Portia Willis, who was a New York suffragist. And she is here walking with uh, these elephants, um, carrying the so-called suffrage plank prior to a parade that was held in Chicago during the Republican National Convention in 1916. So that there are lots of, the, of images out there of these parades. Um, let me just go back to this for a minute. And I just want to say a word about color. Um, in this program, um, and also on the banner that I put here uh, on the front of the podium, you'll see, that the, you'll see three colors, uh, purple, uh, gold and white. These are the colors of the American women's suffrage movement. Um, purple was um, stood for justice, uh, white for purity of intent, um, and gold for courage. Um, the use of gold began with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony's campaign to help pass a state suffrage referendum um, in the 1860s in Kansas. Um, the pro-suffrage forces adopted the Kansas state symbol, which was um, the sunflower, as their symbol. And after that, that flower and the color gold or yellow was associated with the American suffrage cause. Um, the British suffrage movement, and you'll see some of this in some of the cards later on, um, their colors were green, white, and purple. So if you see something with green, white, and purple on it, you know you're looking at a British suffrage item, not an American. That's one way to tell. Okay. So from, from your uh, 2016 vantage point, you, you might be thinking, I asked my students this, you know, what, you know, what was the big deal? You know, why not? guarantee women the right to vote. Why, why, what was all the resistance about? Um, you know, it's, you know, obviously many books have been written about this, and, but I, I just want to say sort of in a nutshell, there were lots of forces that came together to, you know, really actively, affirmatively oppose women's suffrage. Um, number one, I would say, were business interests. Um, the liquor industry, in particular, um, was a huge opponent of women's suffrage. Why? Well, they believed that women would vote for prohibition. And they actually went around uh, plying uh, men with alcohol in exchange for those men voting against suffrage. Interesting, isn't it? In fact, as I was saying <laughs> earlier that, remember, prohibition is the 18th Amendment. Suffrage is the 19th Amendment, so women cannot be held responsible, or at least fully responsible. Um, in fact, after the 19th Amendment, you know, prohibition ended. Um, uh, so, so that was one major business interest. Also, um, and this is interesting given Hamilton's history, the textile industry was a major opponent of suffrage. The, and, and, other, and other industries, uh, like the textile industry, because they were afraid that if women got the right to vote, there would be progressive reform you know, in these sweatshop factories that existed at the, t at the turn of the century. And so they were very big in opposing suffrage. Um, church interest also opposed suffrage um, on the ground that you know, if women got the vote, right to vote, there would just be moral decay in our society and everything would fall apart. Um, but more than, any, more than anything, I think just average, everyday people were really worried about women getting the right to vote. 
they wanted, they were really committed to maintaining the status quo, right? They wanted to keep things the way they had always been. You know, women in their separate domestic sphere, you know, men in the world of commercial interest and, and politics. And so I think a lot of it was just raw fear, right? You know, we see this. We see that fear underlies a lot opposition to a lot of social justice movements, right? We saw this in the you know campaign against marriage equality recently. Just a lot of fear about what this would mean, and a sense that oh my God, the sky is going to fall. Um, in the end, though, um, after 72 years, finally, the right to vote is guaranteed in the Constitution, and that finally comes with the ratification of the 19th Amendment on August 26, 1920. It's now celebrated as Women's Equality Day. Um, we should all get ready because in four years there's going to be an amazing party. You know, we should really do some things here. Um, so, you know, think about this. Given what, how long this took and what it entailed. It was an amazing achievement, really, to finally get the right to vote guaranteed. So Carrie Chapman Catt, who some of you may know, was the leader of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. She wrote a book that sort of summarized you know, this whole movement in her life. And she more than eloquently, more than anyone, really eloquently kind of summarized kind of what had taken place over three generations. And here's what she wrote. Millions of dollars were raised, mainly in small sums. Hundreds of women gave the accumulated possibilities of an entire lifetime. Thousands gave years of their lives. Hundreds of thousands gave constant interest and such aid as they could. It was a continually, continuous, seemingly endless chain of activity young suffragists to help forge the last links of that chain were not born when it began. Old suffragists who forged the first were dead when it ended. Beautifully written and I think perfectly cap captures this, this story. Okay, so that brings me finally uh, to postcards. So today we think of postcards as kind of mass-produced memorable mementos that we send to friends and families kind of mainly when we travel. And even that function, I think, is falling by the wayside. You know, I still do it occasionally. I, you know, I send them to my mother, um, who really likes to get them. But, um, you know, I think that's falling by the wayside. But during their so-called so golden age, which was 1893 to 1918, the social import of postcards rival the power of the internet and social media today. They were used for a, you know, I'm sure you know this, for a variety of purposes, including documenting political campaigns and social justice movements. During the heyday of the women's suffrage movements in both the United States and Britain, uh, postcards both supporting women's suffrage and opposing suffrage were very, very common. Um, there are estimates that there were approximately 4,500 postcards that were produced with the suffrage theme. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to show you that. <laughs> um, so some of them were officially commissioned by women's suffrage groups, and others were officially commissioned by anti-suffrage groups. But interestingly, many, and I would I don't know for sure, but I think most of them were pr produced by private commercial postcard publishers, you know, kind of the hallmark companies of the day. And I think, I don't think they were actually intended, many of them, to be explicitly anti-suffrage, but by tapping into prevailing ideologies about the role of women, these publishers actually, I think, assisted anti-suffrage forces by sort of by perpetuating negative stereotypes about suffragists. Um, so I want to start with the cards that are more blat blatantly <coughs> anti-suffrage. Um, in some ways, these cards are more interesting because they reveal 
very clearly the, the stereotypes and the forces and the fears that confronted the suffrage, the suffrage movement. Uh, and I think int most interestingly for me, they reveal the sources, I think, of negative images and stereotypes that exist today about feminists or about strong women, right? These same things, every time I say the message here uh, is a, about suffragists is X, you could today fill in the message here is about those radical feminists, you know, those crazy feminists, right? So. It's very, I, I do think a lot of this is the seeds of things that are out there today. Okay, so here's the first one. Um, okay, so this one at the bottom. Where, where is my wandering wife tonight? So, you know, and she's in the background on, you know, on a platform, let women run the government. She's out there you know, being a politician. So the message here, right, suffragists you know, neglect their maternal role and the husband is left at home caring for the children. All right, that, you'll, that image comes through over and over, and the kids are usually crying, and he looks very unhappy. Um, this postcard is part of uh, what was called the Suffragette Series, produced in 1909 by the Dunstan Weiler Company of New York, which produced a number of, a, a series of, of suffrage postcards um, uh, that, that, you know, Fair, were fairly negative um, regarding suffrage. Um, and they're sort of noteworthy. You, you'll, you'll see, I have other, others of them, and you'll see that they're noteworthy for their kind of graphic appeal. Um, this one, once I get my liberty, no more wedding bells for me. Uh, the message conveyed here is clearly that, you know, suffragists hate marriage um, and relationships and domestic life. And again, the man will be stuck, you know, doing doing it, you know, for himself and the children, right? So here he's got the bucket and the screaming kids in the background, and you know, it's like the sky will fall, and men are going to be left doing these maternal things. Um, this is another Dunstan Weiler postcard produced um, in 1909. Uh, at the bottom, it says Election Day. Um, sign in the background says, what is a suffragette without a, without a suffering household? So there are lots of plays on the word suffering. That appears very, very often. Uh, this ribbon, uh, the ribbon that she has on says, district captainess. Um, you know, there's just you know, a lot of feminizing you know, typical names. So again, the, you know, the suffragists afflict sort of affirmative harm on the family by abandoning um, this one, I should worry um, if my wife is a suffragette. Um, and here, he, at least he's smiling. This one's a little bit different, but the baby continues to cry. Uh, this one, uh, where women vote, uh, my turn will come. Uh, here, you know, I think it's kind of a domination thing. Uh, suff suffragists don't just want equality, right? They want to dominate, rule men, right, and make them subservient, right? He's he's there, you know, cleaning her boot. Uh, you know, that's what comes through to me in this one. This is another example of an official National Association of Women Suffrage card. Uh, this is one from 1914. It's very typical. I think they would put these out every year, and it would have the map of the United States and. It would depict the, the states that had thus far granted full or partial suffrage. So every year this card came out and it changed. Um, so it's very hard to make out what's written on there. I can make out a little bit of it, but the person who sent the card, uh, you can see her name way at the bottom, Bertha, was part of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which had joined forces with the suffrage movement. Um, you know, hoping, you know, that women would vote for prohibition, um, you know, which I said, though, actually came about before suffrage. Uh, so there was this alliance between the two, though everyone in the suffrage movement was not by any means part of the, the WCTU. Um, this one is from a series by a company called Cobb and Shin. It's distinctive because all of the cards, which are relatively benign, 
uh, have this interesting spelling of women. They all are sp spell women, W-I-M-M-E-N. You know, I don't know why, but it's, it's kind of cute. This one is one of my absolute favorite cards. <laughs> so, you know this is a British card because of the colors, the green, the purple, and the white. And cats were frequently depicted in pro-suffrage cards in Britain. And I, I wondered about this, and I did some re research, and what I found is that it was because of the passage in 1913 of the so-called Cat and Mouse Act in Britain. And that was a law passed by the UK government in response to the use of hunger strikes to uh, buy imprisoned suffragettes. Um, while the suffragettes were in prison, they, in, they refused to eat, and then they, the, the British government officials started force feeding them. Um, and the public got really angry about this. So when they recognized uh, the, the public outcry against this process, they passed this so-called Cat and Mouse Act. And it was officially called the Prisoner's Tempor Temporary Discharge of Ill Health Act. And the way it worked is that it ordered that women who engaged in hunger strikes should be released from prison once they got ill but would be rearrested once they recovered their strength. Um, and that enabled the government to free itself from the responsibility of harming them you know, while they were in prison um, you know, and facing all this negative publicity. Really interesting. Um, so that's why you know, all these cats are used. So I especially love this cat because um, my cat is now deceased, but she looked exactly like this cat. <laughs> And I, I made a color copy of this, and I had it up on my bullet board. She looked so much like this cat that one day my mother came over and she said, did you dress Maddie up like that? <laughs> I, I didn't go that far. <laughs> um, and this one is, is a cute card. I, I don't know anything specific about it, although you know we saw children depicted in other cards. I think they provided a kind of air of innocence to what would otherwise, you know, what otherwise was a really fractious debate. You know, and they sort of put this more into a more palatable mainstream, something that the mainstream could accept. But it's a, it's a cute card. Um, okay, this image, um, I, I really love this beautiful, vibrant image. This is uh, a, re a, a reproduction of a postcard. It's, it's not an actual postcard from the time, though it, though it did exist. I also have some note cards that reproduce this image. This was a pro-suffrage post poster, and it was created by an, art, uh, an artist named Bertha Margaret Roy for the 1911 California suffrage campaign. And this is probably the most popular poster produced during the American suffrage movement. And her design, you can, if you look at it, you, you see that it featured a, this, this draped Western suffragist who's really posed against the Golden Gate Bridge. That's what that is in the background. As the sun kind of sets behind her, it won first place in a contest, a very important contest, uh, in San Francisco. And so this, this image was then reproduced on, on flyers and on cards and on big posters and on publicity stamps. It was very common in California, especially in, in 1911, 1912. Uh, the woman looks to me almost angelic um, and notice the use of gold you know, and the sunburst kind of behind her head to create the halo. I think it's very beautiful. So um, that's it sort of for the postcards. Um, I wanted to show you just a couple of other things to end. So my collection actually includes a lot of other things besides postcards, um, posters, signs, buttons, autographs. I have uh, Susan B. Anthony. I have Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others. Um, but this is my newest edition that I thought I'd show you. It's a suffrage, suffrage pocket watch. Um, and it's very, very unusual. Um, this watch is British, and it says, vote for women. Um, and it's 
in this very peculiar, you know, counterclockwise vote for, and then clockwise women, and then these beautiful, you know, yellow and green in the middle. Um, you know, I don't know why it's it's that way. Um, using the watch, the watches for votes for women began in England. Well, I did I, I did find this out in 1910. Uh, when the suffragists in England erected a clock, in a very big clock in the window of the WSPU, which was the Women's Suffrage Political Union in, in London. Um, and then both men and women at the time you know, used pocket watches quite commonly. Um, women often wore them you know, as a necklace, right? So that I may get a, you know, a necklace and maybe I can wear it during these talks. First, I have to get it working. But I understand I can, I can do that. Um, so I wanted to show you that. It's only about a year ago. So these are just some other things, not necessarily from my collection, but I just thought I'd show you, just to give you a sense of how many things there were. These are suffrage fans, you know, um, practical pieces and very visible. The one in the middle is interesting. It kind of lays out all the reasons women want the right to vote, you know, and so it goes through, you know, they're, you know, they're tax-paying citizens, and you know, they're working women, and they need the ballot to bring about reform and that kind of thing. Uh, you see, there were suffrage umbrellas, signs everywhere. Mothers prepare their children for the world. Let them help prepare the world for their children. Which I, you know, I love that. Uh, flag holders. These are. This is a page displaying a variety of suffrage buttons. Uh, I have. This is the most common one, the gold, which is the simple votes for women. You'll see that some of them say some other things, you know, ballots for both. Uh, but mainly they said votes for women and they were gold. Those are the main, main ones that I've seen. Um, these are broadsides, and they've used, you know, often the yellow, but sometimes with um, a variety of other colors. Uh, pennants, very beautiful. I'd like to have a pen and counter more. Um, and finally, these are um, celebrating the right to vote. These are the buttons that were worn in when women first voted. So under the 19th Amendment, I cast my, my first vote, November 2nd, 1920, voting the Harding, Harding Coolidge ticket, the straight Republican ticket. So there were lots of these kind of buttons you know, that had the, the uh, ribbons attached. Very beautiful. Um, and then this, this actually is from my collection. You know, a sign that was posted in the windows, a woman living here has registered to vote, thereby assuming the responsibility of citizenship. And it's beautiful, it's a really beautiful sign. I, I had it framed, uh, that's why it's in the frame. And so, and then on the podium here is just, this is a replica of suffrage banner created by the National Women's Suffrage Party to celebrate the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And as you can see, this is what I'm talking about this here. Um, it used the three suffrage colors, and then the 36 stars represent the states that ratified the 19th Amendment. Um, so it's a really beautiful banner. So um, that's it. But I, I'd love to and questions? And, um, yes. Here. Well, I appreciate you actually reflecting this back at Hammond, and you've answered a question that bothered me for years. I come from Pinelands Village, uh, one of the railroad era villages uh, in nearby Richland, and there is actually a ghost of what they call the suffragette, you know, suffragette steps there, and she was much maligned. And even today, just recently, last week, I asked some of the old people in the neighborhood, oh, yeah, you couldn't go near her. She was a suffragette. <laughs> well, so, but, but, but it explains because these villages were actually set up as sewing factories for the mills. There was a wood family had the mills in Mays Landing and had the wood they had mills had they, they had mill in uh, in uh, Millville, and they would make the manuf they would manufacture the uh, materials for these little villages. That they would have button factories. They would have sewing yes. factories. And they would have. Uh, uh, rug mills, and so that's why they didn't like these suffragists because 
uh, of the garment industry. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. I'm sure there was a lot of anti-suffrage propaganda you know, in this area. That, that would make perfect sense. But there was a very active suffrage movement, I know, in New Jersey. Uh, I actually have a photograph that was taken when one of the big leaders came to Asbury Park. Um, it's in my living room. It's beautiful. You know, and, you know, putting up a sign advertising her coming, and the ocean is in the background you know, on the Asbury Park boardwalk. So there was definitely was a lot of activity. And you had someone talking right. about So just last week, um, folks, we had um, Patricia Martinelli, the curator of the Byman Historical and Antiquarian Society, give a speech. And Adam um, has captured that on video. So that, too, will live on our website if you didn't get a chance to see that as um, gracious thing about us to videotape the video. And did she talk about things that she has in, in Vineland? Well, more importantly, the global um, movement mm -hmm. and the women mostly contributed to that. Yeah, I'll have to watch that because oh, oh, she talked about Alice Paul. Paul. Yes, yeah, of course. New Jersey is the home. I'm glad you said that. Is the home of Alice Paul. You know, I, I highly encourage you to go visit Paulsdale and Mount Laurel. Um, her home is preserved, and they have a wonderful exhibit there in Paulsdale. Uh, it's it's a great place. You know, I I live very close to Paulsdale, so I go there for events. You know, they have fundraising events, and um, it's a really great place to visit. Yes. The um, Vineland Historical Society does have a collection. Um, yes. I, I'm not quite sure how detailed it is because we were only able to stop for a short time. We're going back in April. Oh, good. But they definitely, like, they have a box that women used. They came and they were determined to vote and they brought their own box and they voted. Of course, their votes didn't count. Yes, but, yes. But, uh, they have that box there. They have, so people here who might be interested in this topic, uh, I think the Vineland Historical Society would be well worth a visit. Yeah, I'm really glad you told me about that. I will definitely go. Yeah. So for 2020, we should do something here. Wouldn't that be fun? Yes. We vote yes. <laughs> we should put together an exhibition of some of that material. Yes. And maybe display it downstairs and maybe it could be some a project involving classes to do research on the objects. Yes. Just saying this as a fellow Stockton person. Yes, yes. That would be exciting. So, um, I had a question. I know it's a whole other lecture, but it would be obvious void of people of color in any of the Yes. Yes, it's very good. Yes. I know it's another lecture. Read a quick broad stroke comment about that? There, in fact, were many of women color, women of color involved in the suffrage movement, but there was also a lot of tension between some of the mainstream white suffrage groups and women of color. And, you know, some very ugly tensions. In fact, in that 1913 parade, um, there was tension about whether the the women of color would be where they would be allowed to march. You know, could they march? You know, in the front of the parade, or were they going to be in the back? And it was some ugly stuff that went on. And it's a sad part <coughs> of this very important it's history. Right. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that kind of started, I think, it was the kickoff of the tension was that um, Stanton and Anthony and the leaders of the suffrage movement really wanted the women's right to vote included in the 15th Amendment. Um, and they were very disappointed when the 15th Amendment only guaranteed you know, denial of the right to vote on the basis of race. That made them really angry. And I think it really kicked off this sort of tension and bitterness um, that caused this crack, this divide, that sort of continued on and off. And, Actually, um, I think Alice Paul, um, who was a Quaker and from New Jersey, uh, was a little bit better on the race stuff um, than some of the earlier uh, suffragists. Um, but none, nonetheless, even even if, and Alice Paul was involved in the 1913 parade, and I do know that parade had you know, some of those racial tensions. But yes, I don't see in the cards depiction of women of color. Well, I really think that we should reintroduce the man apron that I saw in many of the postcards. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great little fundraiser. But, uh, 
there might be some more questions. If not, we have a couple of little items in the back of the morning. So our first um, person who gave a lecture here was one of our colleagues at Stockton, uh, Patricia oh. Chapin. And we in fact purchased this gift for this you, is her great. book. And um, Gina, and Adam, and Sarah, and all of us at Brimham Hall wanted you to have that copy. Oh, wow. This is great. And you are our gift. I mean, really, another round of applause for sure. chose to be here and it's really we're just scratching the surface. Dr. Ogden has been a lecturer here. Mark has been a lecturer here. Dr. Hozik is here, one of our esteemed professors. Um, Dan Pachalis is on our sesquicentennial and each of you has a story, right? So we're very interested in garnering your stories and on your desks, if I may be so bold for my infomercial, um, Gina and Sarah and Adam have provided you with uh, two important pieces of information. Should you have a small collection um, of whatever it is, eyeglasses, <coughs> postcards, Dottie's going to be the first person at the door for Digitization Day, which is April 2nd. And Kate, to your point, we partnered with Dr. Kinsella and some other professors to get students to assist us in the digital humanities to come digitize your items. So you'll come here in Kramer Hall with your personal items. We'll capture them digitally, give you a USB so you'll have them forever for your family, and then you'll rotate around the building and we'll have guest lecturers, one of whom is Gabe Donio, and another one is our colleague Paul Schaaf, and a student, a team, a theatrical student, um, is going to reenact some of the postcards. So they may credit a love story together, just reading the backs of the postcards that some of the town folk, Dottie and her colleague Angela Donio, oh, wow. gave us. And then, that's Saturday, April 2nd from 10 to 2. And then uh, Gina's also, and Adam provided you with a little half sheet there. And so we have another lecture next Wednesday. And I want to say it's at noon. It's at noon, yes. Yeah. Correct. So um, I was in a Navy wave, so a living legend, female who was in the Navy waves, will be speaking in her song, Paul Shop. And then please be sure to come back anytime because for the next three months, the art gallery is dedicated the industries of Hamilton, one of which is the garment industry, which this building celebrates as it was, you know, in the 50s, the garment industry. So I don't know if you have a few minutes to socialize. I do, absolutely. If you like, but otherwise, thank you all for coming. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.